It's Macy's Labor Day sale, so gear up as summer cools down with 30% off timeless looks from Levi's and specials like 30 to 50% off statement making shoes for her and 60% off luggage from Samsonite and more. Or use your coupon or Macy's card and get an extra 20% off more great deals. Plus, Star Rewards members can earn rewards even faster during Macy's Star Money bonus days. Going on now. Savings off regular sale and clearance prices. Exclusions apply. Progressive Snapshot can save you money based on how you drive and how much you drive. So the safer you drive, the more money you could save. Now, if you didn't hear that because you were yelling at another car while driving, let me say it again. You need to calm down. Yelling is just making everyone as stressed out as you are and letting them all know that you definitely aren't trying to save with Progressive Snapshot. <clears throat> and if you did hear it the first time because you weren't yelling at another car, <laughs> nice work. You'd love Snapshot from Progressive because it rewards safe drivers. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Snapshot not available in California and North Carolina or from all agents. Welcome to the Boneyard with Steve Robertson. As always, I am your good friend and host, Steve Robertson, here on the Maroon Friday edition of The Yard. Yeah, speaking of the yard, they're out there cutting the yard now, so you may hear a little background noise, so I apologize for that. But uh, with the busy schedule I've had here as of late and the fact that I got a mower with a rusted out deck, it's been kind of tough to get the grass cut. Not that you signed in for that today, but that's the reality. So if you hear that, don't think I'm under attack. People out here are doing a good job for us, and I really appreciate that. It is Maroon Friday, and it appears we're making a concerted effort to bring Maroon Friday back as a, as a thing. And I've said that on the show before. It was always so much fun when everybody would tweet their pictures wearing the maroon. It felt like we were all part of some connected family. Uh, so I appreciate that. Dak Prescott did a video yesterday kind of celebrating Maroon Friday and teasing that he may be here this weekend. That would be awfully cool, right? So thank you, Dak, and thank you for all that are involved. We're going to have in our first segment show, we're going to talk about some things you need to be aware of on game day. Review a little college football today, and we'll talk about some of the transfer stuff and uh, kind of get you ready to go. Now, wives, again, listen to me. You you married your husband because not because he was flexible, right? You, you married him because he was a handsome prince of a man that was a great provider that got things done, right? That's why you married him. But you understand he's a little stubborn sometimes. So you need to pay special attention today to what I'm going to say on the show. Because everybody's like, oh, I know what to do. I know what to do. Well, things have changed. All right, so I'm trying to save you some aggravation on game day. I want everybody to have a great day tomorrow. I want everybody to have a great day. Everybody come to campus. Let's have a great day tomorrow. Let's commit ourselves to being early because things have changed. All right? Uh, getting a lot of requests, too, about uh, the upcoming Rock Vegas show. I'm just about done now with that. I'm at a point now where I can kind of breathe, and that was kind of my goal to get all this stuff done before uh, football season began. And now we're just kind of waiting for things to come in and waiting for the show to get here. Uh, a lot of people have been very helpful. Uh, some haven't. You know, some, we just kind of stick and move, man. It's like we, we, we try to get some progress here. We don't get it. We just find another alternative. And uh, I, I'm very pleased with what's happened so far and the response uh, coming up. I guess we're probably close to 50% of tickets sold. We will sell out. And so understand that. And I've had a lot of people contact me and say, hey, Steve, again, not really a right guy or gal, or I'm not going to make the show, not going to be in town for the show, but I want to support your efforts. And I appreciate that more than I can possibly say. If you're one of those folks, you buy some tickets and you email them to me at srobertson at jeanspage.com. If that's too much to remember, just hit me up on social media. I'll give you the instructions, and I will make sure those tickets that you bought get into the hands of Mississippi State students, right? There are a lot of Bulldog fans that uh, would love to come to the show and perhaps can't afford a ticket, so we want to maybe do something nice uh, for those young people and uh, give Lillian Axe a chance to play in front of a new generation of fans and have uh, – a new generation of bands play in front of some old uh, rockheads. How about that? So uh, excited about the show. Again, that's September 30th. You can find tickets at eventbrite.com. And uh, links are available plentifully on my social media. I feel like I'm spamming you guys to death. But, uh, again, Rock Vegas, September 30th. That's a Friday night before the A&M game. All the proceeds from ticket sales and our general merchandise goes direct to the Bulldog Initiative. That's a super cool thing. Even going to have like some QRC code set up where you can donate if you want to while you're at the show. Uh, come have a, have a beer or two at, uh, at Hobie's on Main in the old State Palace Theater. I'm excited about it again. A lot of cool things are happening. And uh, matter of fact, I've already begun preparations for next year. 
to have an even bigger show next year because I want this to be an annual event. A couple reasons why. Number one, I want to make sure that we are a player in NIL and do what we can and not just have to, you know, there's some people out there that are very generous that will say, hey, Steve, I'm going to go ahead and set up monthly disbursements. I had a gentleman just yesterday on jeanspage.com that messaged me and said, hey, Steve, I've heard you talk so much about this. I've been inspired. I'm now doing 75 bucks a month to the NIL. And you say, well, Steve, that's not a lot of money. You know what? It's not as an individual. But if we have maybe 1,000 people do that over the course of a year's time, it is a significant amount of money. So anything that you can do helps. And, and whether you agree with NIL or not, and I was a very reluctant convert because I, I, I thought it was going to be a much different deal, honestly. I didn't think it would be like it is. But I'm all in now, and so I understand – until we get some national legislation in place, there's some things we're going to have to do. We're not going to be able to depend on somebody else to bail us out. We're not going to you know, just have to expect Mickey Holloman or Richard Ackerson to write another big check. We're, we're going to have to help at a grassroots level. So rather than get out here and, and, and complain, I said, let's put our money where our mouth is. And, and then, yeah, I could write a check you know, for you know, a few thousand dollars and just give it, but why not take that few thousand dollars and invest it in an event and maybe turn that four or five thousand dollars into twenty to twenty five thousand dollars? Right? With your help? I think that's a better way to do it. And so next year we're gonna to look to do something even bigger. I have already been in contact with a major recording artist about next year's show and uh, had some correspondence with their booking agent and they wanna do our show next year. We haven't even done our show this year. They want to do the show next year. And uh, a band that uh, many of you, I'm not, I'm not going to give it away mu- too much until we get a deal in place. I don't want to hint around too much. But if you were around central Mississippi in 91, you probably saw this band play in the Coliseum. And I'll just kind of leave it at that. I'll probably just leave it at that for now. So, again, until we get a deal in place, not going to make an announcement because what if something changes? What if that we can't work out a date or, you know? So it's going to require more of an effort on my part, and uh, we're going to get some things together. Once I get through this show, we're going to be a lot more organized because I, I've just basically done all this myself. I've had a lot of people that have reached out and said, hey, Steve, I'd like to help kind of going forward. A lot of people have wanted to help me now, but I had a pretty good plan to kind of get it all done, and, and we have. But next year, it's going to be a much bigger deal. So we're going to need some help. And we're going to need some major sponsorships. And I'll be reaching out to some people. There are a lot of people locally that have been very, very generous uh, with their money. And, uh, you know, we, we thank them. And we're going to give them recognition, you know, on our shirts and our banners and at the show. And, and so I think it's important to understand this is not just a Steve Robertson project. Well, I'm kind of the face of it. There are a lot of people behind the scenes that have contributed their hard-earned money to make sure that we get a killer rock show here in Starkville and raise some money for our student athletes. And so again, if you want to participate, but maybe not attend, buy tickets, send them to me. I'll make sure they get into the hands of Mississippi State students that may want to come out for a great night. The gift of rock and roll. Let's thank our friends at Bulldog Burger Company. I love Bulldog Burger Company. You will too, if you don't already. Go by and check them out. Three great locations to serve you. University Drive here in Starkville. And if you haven't been to town in a while, you'll enjoy that new patio area. Kind of a cool evening yesterday too. Good good night maybe to eat outside. So be sure and go check that out. Also Lake Harbor Drive there in the Ridge and Flowood area and Gloucester Street there in Tupelo. I love Bulldog Burger Company. I know what I'm going to get there. It's always going to be a quality experience, quality food at a great price. And those portions, man, that's a, I, I talk about that all the time, and it's because I travel so extensively and I eat a lot of places. And there are a lot of people out there giving you less for more. They're charging you a little bit more, and they're giving you a little bit less. Not Bulldog Burger Company. They're just not doing that. Still the same generous portions that we had pre-COVID, and they haven't jacked up their prices either. A lot of people out there doing the best they can to figure it out, but our friends at Bulldog Burger Company – very consistently doing the job they've always done and really doing it better than ever for the same price. Be sure and go check them out. Bulldog Burger Company, the place where people go to meet. M-E-A-T. Okay. Now I'm going to talk to you wives. I'm talking to you first. Now there'll be some of you gentlemen that'll say, you know what, I'm going to heed the advice of Steve, which is always smart. I'll never steer you wrong. But there are a few things you need to know. Now I can't remember who posted this on Facebook. I didn't, and I wish I could remember who did, 
and I would give them credit. So I'm not just stealing their thunder here. I just don't remember. They made a post on Facebook, and I wish I could remember. But he absolutely nailed it. Absolutely nailed it. Now, we're going to have a huge influx of people. I understand there's less than 5,000 tickets available for the game. So if, if you're thinking of coming, maybe go ahead and get that lined up. You know, you'll be able to buy some at the ticket office, but uh, probably smart to get that lined up. So w- we may not have a sellout, but we're going to have a near-capacity crowd against Memphis. So understand there's going to be a lot of people coming to town. They're going to want to eat. Now, a lot of our eating establishments in town don't have a full staff, especially on the fast food side of things. So as you come to town... Bring some extra patience with you. That's patience with a CE. I don't want you bringing anybody, you know, that needs medical attention. You understand my point? Because there, are, it's not the people that showed up for work that are causing the delays. It's the people that didn't show up for work, and it's the people that didn't keep a job, and the people that quit. And there's, everybody's got opinions about that. I don't want to get in, into some political commentary about that. The reality of it is this. We don't have a lot of fully staffed fast food restaurants in town. We don't. Many of them still have, many of them still have the, uh, you know, the lobby closed. You stand, some of them you can't go eat within the restaurant. So right out of the gate, I understand. Because listen, I deal with this sometimes on a daily basis. I won't tell you which one. There's one fast food restaurant I'll probably never go back to. It had two people working the window. One person making the food, one person taking the orders, and they're taking one order at a time. I I don't have time for that. And so the reality of it is, is you're going to deal with some of that. There will be delays. It's not anybody's fault, per se. But understand that when you show up. Like, I I went to Sonic last night, and this is one thing the gentleman mentioned. And again, I, I appreciate his post. I went to Sonic last night because yeah, sometimes when I, I live out in the sticks, man. I'm, I'm out here in you know, out here in the sticks, and so sometimes I just like to go, run to Walmart or whatever and get something quick, rather than run up and down 12. And Sonic's the closest thing to me. Okay, so none of the stalls are open, none of them. You have to either go through the drive-through or use your app. Download the Sonic app and then order from that, and then pull up and let them know which stall you're in. They'll bring your food out to you. But they don't have the bellhops. They don't. They just they don't have the staff to do it. And so it's important to understand they're not alone. This is not a failure of Sonic. This is just kind of the reality of the labor situation we're in. And there are a lot of people you would think, man, well, the school's back in session. Why aren't the college kids working? That Well, some of them are, but a lot of them aren't. So understand that before you get here, we want you to spend your money here, but I'm just telling you, you need to be prepared that there's going to be delays because we don't have enough staff and there's going to be a big influx of people here. Going to be a lot of people wanting to get a hamburger. So understand that. Right out of the gate, that's something you got to deal with. Leave early. Know where you need to park. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. There have been some changes. Now, there have been some game day enhancements. And uh, let's give Red Hobart credit for all of it. No, I'm I'm joking. That's an inside joke. You know, anything good that happens in my life when I see Red, I say, hey, Red, I just did this. Thanks, Red. You know, it's it's a big joke. But Red, listen, Red Red needs to be here. I love Red Hobart. He's great. Um, A great addition and a great bulldog. So here's something, speaking of great additions. Going to have a brand new Hell State tailgate in the junction. So maybe, like, you want to get here early. You're like, well, what am I supposed to do? I don't want to go sit in the bleachers. It's a long game. Well, maybe you don't have friends that have a tailgate. Chances are you'll meet some at a tailgate. But if you're uncomfortable doing that, if you feel like you're interloping on somebody else's tailgate, and chances are you might be. Some people may not want you around. The university is going to have a free tailgate set up right there by the M Club building, right off that little brick plaza, right? You'll know it. You get to the junction, and there it is. Going to have live music there. You're going to have the Groove Factor. I haven't heard of those guys, but the Groove Factor is performing uh, tomorrow. Also going to have two large video screens set up so you can can kind of keep up to date with games around the country. Going to have food trucks and beverage stations within walking distance of the all-tailgate area. So, like, 
all these other places. Like, so I didn't bring food. Well, you're going to have a chance to go do that. And that, that, and that is great to be able to do that, too, to support these uh, food truck vendors, but also, too, to provide you all with some the dining options. That's going to open four hours before the game. Now, about 45 minutes prior to kickoff, they'll start shutting everything down. So if you want to get there early and just kind of enjoy the time with the Mississippi State family, you've got somewhere to go now. And, again, I'm encouraging you to get here early just because of the fact there's just a lot going on, right? Get here early, and you'll have somewhere to go, and you can get some snacks, and you don't have to automatically go into the stadium. You can just kind of get out there and chill with some folks. Now, they've also made the Bullies Kid Zone bigger. As it says, they're getting a makeover. Several new features for our young bull pups. All new interactive games and photo opportunities presented by our friends at Coca-Cola. An expanded inflatable area for your kids. And it, like when I was a kid, like we had a trampoline, and then like once they had inflatables, like I'm from the 1900s, so that, that was kind of a new thing. It's like nowadays, like people do this for their birthday parties, and sometimes kids do too. Uh, Bully and Belle will be there too. You can get your picture made with them. It's always good. Again, hours are similar. Opens four hours before the game, and will close around 45 minutes because we're you know we're here for the game. All right, so we're going to have the dog walk is back. Kind of a different deal, and so you need to be mindful of that. The dog walk will take its traditional route of winding its way from Stone Boulevard through the heart of the junction. The buses will drop off two hours and 15 minutes prior to kickoff on every game day. So probably two hours and 30 minutes before kickoff, you need to get in line if you want to do the dog walk. It's a great thing. It's a great thing, and a lot of people you know, didn't like the fact that we didn't have it, and it was different. We're going back to what we've done before. People love it. You need to be a part of it. Bully will be there, too. Pretty cool thing, too, they're doing. Uh, they're going to have the drum line is going to do a little performance there also as part of the dog walk. Like right, right after the dog walk, they're going to have like the drum line performance. That's a cool thing, too. That's going to be about Dorman Hall. Famous Maroon Band warm-up will be in a 10 gym, the McCarthy Gymnasium. You can go in there and watch those guys and, and gals warm up. That's going to be an hour and 45 prior to kickoff. So you can go to Dog Walk, hear the drum line play, and then walk over to the 10 gym and uh, watch the famous Maroon Band warm up. That's a cool thing, man. It's a cool thing. Now, it's important to understand that um, – you know, there's just a lot that goes into these events, and, and they're just trying to make it much easier you know, for you to have a great day on the Mississippi State campus. And maybe that stuff doesn't appeal to you. Maybe you're like, hey, I got friends that have a tailgate. We just go hang with them, and that is absolutely cool. But if you're looking to do something a little bit different, Mississippi State's providing. Hey, Bulldog business owners and hiring managers out there, the holiday season's right around the corner. Don't remind you, right? You probably got some staffing needs that you need to fill. Well, let me tell you about our friends at LinkedIn. As you get ready to gear up for your hiring needs, make sure that your small business or large business for that matter is firing on all cylinders. LinkedIn Jobs is here to make it a whole lot easier to find the right people that you want to talk to fast and free. Create a free job post in just minutes on LinkedIn Jobs to reach your network and beyond to the world's largest professional network of nearly 810 million people. Add your job and the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring and you can find people within your network to help fill your needs. Simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skill set and experience to maximize your hiring potential. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality applicants versus their leading competitors. LinkedIn jobs helps you find the candidates you want to talk to faster than ever did you know that every week nearly 40 million job seekers visit LinkedIn? Maybe it's time that you gave it a try. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash boneyard. That's linked, L-I-N-K-E-D-I-N dot com slash boneyard. Terms and conditions may apply. It's Macy's Labor Day sale, so gear up as summer cools down with 30% off timeless looks from Levi's and specials like 30 to 50% off statement making shoes for her and 60% off luggage from Samsonite and more. Or use your coupon or Macy's card and get an extra 20% off more great deals. 
Plus Star Rewards members can earn rewards even faster during Macy's Star Money bonus days. Going on now. Savings off regular sale and clearance prices. Exclusions apply. Give you some opportunities to do that. Now, let's jump into this parking stuff. And this is important. Wives, listen up. I love you, even if uh, your dude doesn't always say it. I know he loves you too. And because you love him and the children, you want to have a good day. I would encourage you to look at this parking map ahead of time. Maybe even print it out. Screenshot it, put it on your phone. All right, so here are your parking guidelines. Debit and credit cards are now the only option in public parking lots. There will be no cash parking. None. So I know there's like, oh, they'll, they'll take my money. Well, if they do, chances you may get your car towed. Not to suggest that anybody would do anything improper, but my point being is that in the past, it's like, oh, well, I'll just go pay and go park, and that's what a lot have always done that. Well, now, nowadays, no. There will be no tents, tables, or chairs permitted in any parking spaces or on sidewalks. I have seen some in the past in parking spaces. Maybe you're a violator, maybe not. Uh, parking on grass is permitted only in designated areas. Now, there are less grass lots than there used to be. Like, we, media parking used to be a grass lot over there not too far from Barnes & Noble. We're parking in the garage now. No parking's allowed on parking lot islands, medium, medians, berms, or shoulders of streets. You should probably know that already. And parked vehicles may not obstruct traffic or pedestrian access to sidewalks. You can't save a parking space. They'll get on to you about that. And tailgating is permitted only in areas where traffic or parking is not obstructed and tailgaters must follow all picnic zone regulations. Um, parking areas must be cleared by 7 a.m. the following day. All buses must enter the campus at the intersection of Highway 182 and George Perry. So I understand that. After unloading the bus, we'll turn around to the park facing Eastley Boulevard. Center campus roads close four hours before kickoff. That's a thing to understand that too. You'd like if you're used to being on campus and all of a sudden there's a road that's closed that ordinarily is open, that's why because we're trying to make that more of a pedestrian friendly area. Again, see the map for parking and it, like you can you can just go to hellstate.com and you can pull this thing down and check it out yourself. Also looking for tickets, you can find of course those through the uh, hellstate.com slash tickets if you don't want to just go to the, uh, the ticket office there. All right, Research Park located in north in the vet school located at south parking lots are 10 bucks, 10 bucks per vehicle or trailer, but that's going to be digital. You can't just show up and, and, and just pay 10 bucks. Can't do it. Now, a couple of things I want to tell you about this. There are some, uh, I'm looking for it now, but um, there are some parking spaces close to buildings that historically have been like open for you but now it's being used for official purposes so in the event you pull up there and they say hey I, you can't park here and you're like well i've always parked here oh, things changed understand that things changed and it's just a handful of spots I and mean, it's not you're not going to have like lots closed off but there there's a handful of spots kind of like that, that butt up against buildings that are going to be for official use only. So please, I beg of you, on behalf of those poor people that are working out there in the sun, please don't give them a hard time. They're just doing what they're asked to do. And you're going to say, well, I've always parked here. Yeah. Well, that may be true. That may be true. But we're not doing that anymore. So you got to park somewhere else. And I'm, I'm a creature of habit. I hate change. I do. I do. And I, I saw a meme earlier today. It's like if I go around and I can't find a good parking space, I'm, I'm more likely to go home than anything else. I can't stand not being able to find a parking space. It's one of my big pet peeves in life. So if you're like me, leave early. Leave early. Save yourself some aggravation and stress and some aggravation and stress for everybody around you. There's no point in getting hostile. No point in getting anxious or upset. Leave early. Like my dad used to always tell me, early is on time and on time is late. Right? If that makes sense to you. If the meeting's supposed to start at 9, we need to be there at 8.30. If the meeting starts at 9 and we show up at 9, we're being disrespectful to the meeting holders, right? So, so get there early. It's a gift for yourself, really. It really is. You're just saving yourself a lot of time, passion, and grief. So 
be sure and check those things out. A couple of things I want to talk about before we get into today's top 10 list. I am not on this nominating committee for the Ring of Honor uh, at Davis White Stadium. I- I'm not. And maybe perhaps I should be, but I'm not. I think I should be on the committee for the uh, Ron Polk Ring of Honor. I-, I think so. I don't know if there's anybody that keeps up Mississippi State baseball history like me, but I digress. You know, we need to have Rocky Felker's name in the Davis Wade Stadium Ring of Honor. Now, the point that I'm about to make, I think will be obvious to people once I say it. I think sometimes guys like Rocky, and there are not a lot of them, Rocky was the SEC Offensive Player of the Year. We've only had a handful of those in our program's history. Rocky Felker was that dude. He was. As Bob Tower told me when I interviewed him uh, for Alpha Dogs, Rocky was a magician with the football. You just rolled the football out, let him take over. He was incredible. Rocky's in his 70s now. So let's honor him while he's young and able to appreciate it. And a lot of it, too, I think, uh, you know, Rocky might actually be on the nominating committee, and, you know, Rocky has given his life and his career to the betterment of Mississippi State. I think sometimes people think, ah, oh, you know, well, you know, we forget. You see Rocky all the time, so it's like, well, you know, if Rocky lived in California and came back to campus about once every five years, you'd probably view him differently, right? Like, oh, it's so great, you know, if we get him back on campus more often. Well, well, he's here all the time, so I think sometimes it's kind of a forest for the trees type deal. I think sometimes we just kind of overlook a guy like Rocky Felker. It's like an obvious choice is right there in our face. And so if you're on that nominating committee or you know somebody that is, let me encourage you, let's give Rocky Felker his just due. Rocky is one of the greatest players to ever play at Mississippi State. Was the youngest coach in college football when he got the job. We ended up firing him. He left and was gracious enough to come back, work as an assistant coach, worked uh, as direct, with director of player personnel for a while, helped our our players with scouts and things of that nature and does has done some work for the Bulldog Club. And we can't run Rocky off, so let's honor him. The guy has given his entire professional career, with rare exception, to Mississippi State University. And I'm going to stand on this hill, and I know I'm not alone. I know many of you will, will probably comment on the message board or you'll, you'll tweet or you'll message me on Facebook and say, Steve, you're right on. Rocky Felker absolutely deserves to be in our ring of of honor and my hope is you know we can get that done sooner rather than later I think it'd be a great moment for him and 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 his family but also too for that generation of Bulldog fans that got to see Rocky kind of be the guy and he was he was an absolute magician you've all seen the video of him uh, scoring the two-point conversion to cap a 98-yard touchdown drive to beat Memphis you've seen it but I don't think you understand the significance because we see Memphis through, like, different eyes today. It was a big deal to beat Memphis back then. It really was. And so there was so much more to it than that, than the one play or the one drive or the one game. And so I'm going to go to bat for my guy, Rocky Felker, who was also in Stark Villains. Him and Howard Lewis sat with me, and we talked at length about their careers here. And if you ever get a chance to sit down with those two right there, just go ahead and park yourself for the rest of the night. It's going to be an entertaining evening. And I don't just say this because Rocky Falker is my friend. And I don't just say this because Rocky Falker was a guy that um, has done a lot off the field. Rocky Falker deserves to be in our ring of honor for his accomplishments as a player. The rest of it is just a bonus. And so I, I share that with you as openly and honestly as I can because I think those things are important. Another thing that I'm talking about, too, as we get ready to get into today's top ten list, I went to the Max in Meridian recently. Extremely well done. I I was very, very impressed. It's a self-guided tour. You can go in there, and there's so much amazing things. And I was kind of in a bit of a hurry. I probably didn't budget enough time. But it's, it's great. I mean, the exhibits are absolutely fantastic. And it's like sometimes, too, in Mississippi, we kind of cut corners, right? Well, that's good enough. Hey, this thing is not good enough. It's great. It's great. I think we've got, you know, we, we kind of got to get up to speed 
with some uh, inductions. We're probably a little bit behind. Uh, but the reality of it is, is uh, I, I'm, I'm going to stomp for somebody, and I've already reached out to a couple people, and maybe you will join me in this, but uh, Tommy Aldridge is not in the max. Now, I, I'm not in any way going to suggest that there are other people in there that are less deserving, because I think everybody in the max absolutely deserves to be in there without question. So in no way am I trying to say, well, this person's in, so Tommy should be in. Tommy Aldridge should be in the max based on his own merit. The guy has sold millions of records. Millions. He was the drummer for Black Oak, Arkansas for years and years and years. Pat Travers Band, Ozzy Osbourne, Whitesnake. He's played with everybody. He is the drummer's drummer. You talk to anybody in modern rock music today, and they'll tell you Tommy Aldridge is the god of thunder. And he was born in Jackson, Mississippi, Raised in Pearl, Mississippi. There's a lot of people in Rankin County that are very, very huge fans of Tommy's. I'm a huge fan of Tommy's. And I understand that Tommy Aldridge plays rock and roll, right? I and mean, we're the home of rock and roll. We're the home of the rhythm and blues. And so it's time for us to kind of take a step here and it, to get Tommy in. Tommy's still out there on the road of Whitesnake right now at, what, 72, 73 years of age? In his 70s, still playing at a high level. The guy's an absolute legend. You talk to anybody in drumming, and they'll tell you Tommy Aldridge is that dude. And so I'm not going to shut up about this because I, it's not that I'm trying to tell anybody how to do their job. I just want to be helpful. I want to be helpful because I think sometimes, too, we go, you know, like I, I would not be able to, outside of the a handful of blues legends, I could not intelligently speak about the blues trail in Mississippi. I love to learn about that stuff, but I'm not an expert on that. But when it comes to 80s rock, 90s rock, modern rock, well, I, yeah, I got you there. You may be a huge Marty Stewart fan. I'm not a country music guy, but it's, it's impossible to deny Marty Stewart's footprint as a musician. A guy that absolutely deserves to be in there. He is. Marty absolutely is. And so... I would not be able to put a list together for you unless we're talking about Faith Hill or, you know, uh, you know, people of that stature, you know, that have been kind of national. I, I wouldn't be an expert on that. But I am an expert on this. I'll die on this hill. I can debate all that stuff with you whenever you want. But Tommy Aldridge needs to be in there. And so anybody in the sound of my voice that has some access there that knows about the nominating process or who we need to contact, we need to get this done. This, and this is not a vanity project. This is the right thing to do. Tommy Aldridge deserves to be included in this. And, and I, I put it on Facebook, and I've had so many people that could, they can't believe he's not already in there. And let's be fair, I mean, the, the Max is still basically a few years old. And so we're getting caught up there. So, again, I'm not being critical of those people. I'm just saying that we need to get this done. And no way am I suggesting that there's kind of been some omission or that he's being snubbed. And I'm not suggesting that at all. I just think perhaps he hadn't been nominated yet. So let's, what do we need to do to get him nominated? That's what I want to know. All right, time for today's top 10 list brought to you by Close with Blair.com. That's C L O S E with Blair, B L A I R.com. That's Blair Chandler, my friend, your friend, a friend in the industry. That's a mortgage industry, a very convoluted and complicated process. Sometimes you need like a pint of blood, a note from your mother a lock of your first child's hair. I mean, some the underwriters, I mean, there's just, you know, it's crazy the things they ask for. Sometimes I think when I was in the mortgage business, I think they did it just to mess with us. You know, it's like, hey, let's just see how what, what we can do to get these loan officers, you know, jumping. So the reality of it is you need a guy that's been there and done that that maybe can go down there and plead your case to an underwriter to get your loan approved. Well, that's Blair Chandler. 21 years of experience, back-to-back -back years in a top 1% close ratio in the country. Not just in Stone County, not just in Possum Neck, nationally. Works at Fairway Mortgage, recently voted number one in customer satisfaction when it comes to mortgage loan origination. Maybe you're looking to refinance. Maybe you're looking to buy a home for the first time. I can tell you, I shared a story earlier this week. Blair is a guy that gets things done. If other lenders can't get it done, I would give, uh, I would give Blair a chance. Blair is a guy that can take a scratch and dent loan and get it done. That's all you care about, right? It's like, hey, you know, I know that I'm kind of a non-conforming borrower. Or maybe I've got an atypical property. I know that it's not a real straightforward loan. So you need an expert. 
You don't need a greenhorn. You need somebody who's been there and done that. That's, that's Blair Chandler at CloseToBlair.com. Let me give you Blair's number. 601-500-2344. Again, 601-500-2344. And if you mention to him that you heard about him on the boneyard, he's going to pay for your appraisal. How about that? How about that? And this is a guy, too, that I mean, the boneyarders do business with Blair regularly. We were talking the other day about the loans that he's picked up from you guys. So keep it in the family. Blair's a guy that's a bulldog, got a place up here, season ticket holder, multiple sports. But here's the deal, too. He'll do business with any of you guys, too. But uh, if you listen to this show, you get that nice little discount. All right. So we're going a little different direction today. I hit Roy up. I said, oh, yeah, I was thinking about doing it. I said, well, let me do a Tommy Aldridge list. And I said, I don't know. I couldn't, uh, couldn't put it together in time without doing a lot of research. And Oh, which reminds me, once we get Tommy Aldridge in the max where he deserves, and again, not being critical of anybody, I'm just saying that needs to happen. The next guy that I'm going to be, the, the next guy on my list that I'm going to champion the cause for is Gulfport, Mississippi's own Greg Jafria. Greg needs to be in there. And Greg, of course, with, with Angel, and then Jafria, and then House of Lords. Greg Jafria, a very accomplished musician that you know, played with everybody. Matter of fact, Gene Simmons picked Greg Jafria to build a band around, and that ultimately became House of Lords. So we've got some people out there that uh, in modern rock that maybe haven't gotten their proper recognition. And so, hey, look, let's go. I mean, I think sometimes, too, you know, it, it's kind of an out of sight, out of mind thing. It's like, well, you know, we got the obvious choices, and then now, okay, well, now what do we have? And I think sometimes we as a people – as a rock family, we have to get together on the grassroots and say, hey, here's somebody worthy of recognition. And it may not work out. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of very talented baseball players, not in the Hall of Fame either. Uh, but this is something that I think we, we as Mississippians, can poke our chest out about is how, how talented we have been uh, in the musical genres over the years. And uh, let's recognize our rock musicians, too. All right, today we're going to go with... Uh, Without a doubt, the most successful Christian metal band of all time. I'm talking Striper. You may be familiar with them. They've got an interesting story. They were rejected early on, kind of by the church, because they didn't look like Christians. And I, I, again, I ask you, what does a Christian look like? You know, John the Baptist had dreadlocks and uh, you know slept in the desert and used a, a rock as his pillow and ate locusts. I suspect he did not look like a Christian of the modern church at the time. And Jesus had long hair too. You know, so what's a Christian supposed to look like, right? So a lot of people, oh, they're too much from the world. We can't support them. But young people, young people in church, youth groups and Bible colleges, and they're like, hey, we've got a metal band of our own. And they're singing positive lyrics. and They're singing about salvation and they're witnessing to people. So they got behind them. And then four albums in, Striper decided, you know what, we're going to write basically just a secular album. And they, they, they went, they were as brazen to name the album Against the Law. And all of a sudden, all these people that had supported him were like, hey, they're no longer wearing the B outfits. They don't have their black and gold stuff. These guys are, you know, they're, they're relapsing on us. They're leaving the faith. They're selling out to the world, and it basically caused this tailspin for Striper that led to them disbanding. They eventually reunited. Now, there may be some bangers later in the catalog. I have not had a chance to listen to the more recent Striper albums. Uh, Tim Gaines uh, originally was probably the most accomplished guy in the band. He was with the band Stormer and uh, played at all his great clubs out in Hollywood. And uh, unfortunately, the record company they signed with went belly up. Uh, but Tim Gaines was with them for a long time. Now Perry Richardson, formerly of Firehouse, is the bass player. But uh, it is Robert and Michael Sweet, of course, Oz Fox. And Oz had some cancer issues a while back. And I understand that he's doing much better now. Oz Fox is not truly celebrated as a guitarist. And um, he and Michael Sweet do a gr- good job with the dual lead guitar thing. Kind of queens Reiki a bit at times. And uh, Michael's got more of that operatic voice. And uh, Mike sent some things with some other people, too, and some projects that are, that are really, really good. But here is a Striper Top Ten. I cannot remember, and Roy didn't tell me, and he may have just lost track, but um, who requested Striper? But we're finally getting to it. 
And uh, my brother, who attended Wesley College and played basketball there, he and all his friends were like huge Striper fans. Huge. Huge. Listen to bands like Striper and Bloodgood and Petra and people like that. And they liked to rock. They just didn't want the secular rock. And so they were huge Striper fans. And I remember when all this happened with the Against the Law coming out, everybody's like, oh, my gosh, what are we going to do now? All right, so here we go. Number 10 from the debut album. It was actually an EP called The Yellow and Black Attack. The song is Loud and Clear, which is the lead track on that EP. Great track. Very typical of the time. Very, 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 very typical of the time. It really kind of fit in. Number nine, also, The Rock That Makes Me Roll. That's off the uh, Soldiers Under Command album. That's a really good album, too. It was their first full-length LP as the Weed Eater passes by the office here. Uh, Great track. I love the guitar on it. And again, very, very typical for the time. Number eight, the title track from that second album, or the first full-length album, is Soldiers Under Command. It's a great song. I like how it builds. It's got a great message. Number seven, the title track from their fourth album, And God We Trust. Now, this has a great harmony to open up, and it was kind of the follow-up to their most successful album. And I think a lot of people, you know, were expecting, like, superstardom for them. So, you know, to hell with the devil went platinum. I think, if I remember correctly, Striper had three gold records, at least two. So, this wasn't just... You know, like a, a clickish thing where it was just like the Bible school kids buying these records. I mean, everybody was buying these records because all of a sudden Striper was on. T- once that, once a, To Hell With The Devil came out, they were on MTV all the time. They were just like all the other metal bands, except they were singing about Jesus and about God and about salvation and about everlasting life and things like that. So they were a very positive thing. And there were still a lot of people in church that rejected them. They thought, oh, they must be phony. You know, well, that's what they thought. And then, of course, we had all the televangelist scandals on top of all that stuff. And and I can promise you, those those guys' haircuts are much different than the guys in Striper. The guys in Striper may not look like Christians, but they certainly acted more like Christians than some of these televangelists a lot of people sent their money to rant over. All right, uh, number six, the only song that makes our list from the Against the Law album is uh, Lady. Now, I don't even remember if it got released as a single. I know they released uh, Shining Star. They covered Shining Star on Against the Law. And Randy Jackson from Journey and American Idol fame played bass on that one. Tim Gaines didn't. Randy Jackson did. How about that? But the song we're going to use is is Lady. It's a great ballad. And uh, I remember I was dating this girl from Bassfield at the time when this album came out. And uh, I remember I w- left her house, and I was so excited about her, and I listened to this song all the way home. And for you young bucks today, you don't understand what it took, the effort it took to listen to a song on repeat on cassette. Because even though we had CD players at the time, we didn't have them in our car. So that, that came a little bit later. And so you'd have to have, you know, cassettes, and sometimes you would dub your CDs on the cassettes. So you could listen to them in the car. But I listened to this all the way home. Now, Bassfield and Columbia weren't that far apart, so it's not like I you know, drove across country, but I listened to this song over and over again. Love that song. Uh, pr- to me, it's a shiny moment on that album. All right, number five is Always There For You. And that's, again, a very singable song, got a great upbeat medley. The guitar on it is wonderful. Always There For You. Wouldn't that be great if that's how everybody kind of lived their lives? Uh, number four this was a huge hit for them. And it's just in the power ballad era. And this, of course, you know, a lot of people kind of took this as a relationship song, but it was really about a relationship between, you know, a person and, you know, salvation, a person and God and Jesus Christ. And it's honestly great song, very heartfelt song. I think it's one of Michael Sweet's shiny moments as a recording artist. Number three, it's calling on you. This was everywhere on MTV. I, I think this is the one that really kind of got them going. I think people are like, oh, well, this is Striper. Oh, okay, well, I thought it was just going to be a big Bible drill, and they were going to give you scripture. No, these guys, these guys could rock. And I think this album and the MTV play really opened up some eyes to this band, and people are like, you know, dude, hey, it's cool. It's cool to go to church, and it's cool to, to have a, a moral code. You know, it doesn't always have to be about partying and nothing but a good time. I mean, you can actually sing about things that are positive in life. Number two, the song Free. 
I love this one too. I, I love everything about the composition of this song. Uh, it is one of those songs too that I, I think you probably have heard and don't remember because it seemed like when it was a single, it was everywhere. You're free, free to do what you want, but it's, it's different. It's not like freedom in the hedonistic or hippie type way. It's a great track. Be sure and check that one out. But number one, and I uh, read an article here, I don't know, maybe a year or two ago, and the, art, the author of this article mentioned this song was one of the most significant songs in American rock history. Now, I don't know if I agree with that, but I would think maybe within that decade, this was something that was very, very significant because a lot of people in metal at the time were kind of singing about the occult and everything was kind of dark and black. And, and then Striper comes out with To Hell with the Devil right? It's like, you know, it's like you guys are talking about the Antichrist. We're, we're, we're talking anti-devil over here. And so to hell with the devil, it is an absolute banger of a song. And I don't, I don't care what your religious beliefs are. If you like rock and roll, you should check it out. These guys can absolutely rock. And again, three of the four original members still with the band and they're still touring today. They reunited. They released an album. I guess they've done about five albums. I guess once they reunited, they recorded Reborn, which is kind of like some Uh, re-recordings of some of their earlier songs so striper on the top 10 list today my brother pat will be incredibly excited about this because this was uh one of his favorite bands and so we'll dedicate it to him my brother patrick robertson and uh, so yeah he, he has wanted me to do this list for a while and i don't know why i haven't done it but we've done it today so there you go pat and to, to lewis martin and all your friends that went to wesley college this is for all of you guys that had all those videotapes and we would sit in those dorms. We'd go play basketball and everybody get tired of playing and we'd go and sit in Lewis Martin's room because he had a VCR and we'd watch the Striper videos and then we'd eat pizza and we were so cool, right? It was such a great time though. And so again, not everything that rocks is going to send you to hell, right? So understand that right out of the gate. Striper, a very positive band and uh, made some mistakes. And uh, really kind of cost them their career, but ultra talented. But uh, they're back and uh, had a number one album a couple years ago on the rock charts. How about that? I think, again, people are ready to rock again. So thank you, Striper, for rocking with religion. If you have an idea for the top ten list, reach out and let us know. We may just do it. The best way to communicate with us is to reach out to Roy on Twitter at Dogmatic67. That's D-A-W-G-M-A-T-I-C-6-7. And send him your idea. And if we've already done it, he'll send you the list that we've already done. How cool is that? And uh, Roy, getting close to a job and uh, excited for Roy. And I want to thank everybody, too, that have been so supportive of Roy. Uh, he does this for free because he loves the show and he loves music. And uh, he and I will be going to see Judas Priest here in a couple months. How about that? I've never seen Priest. How about that? I've seen Queensryche multiple times. I've never seen Judas Priest. So we're going to go see Judas Priest and Queensryche together there in South Haven. Yeah, it's going to be cool. So, thanks for your support of the uh, top 10 list. And uh, again, I appreciate your comments, your feedback, whether we agree or not. I think it's just cool to talk music. You know, I'm a music guy, I'm a rock guy. And so, I enjoy talking with other people of the rock persuasion. All right, next segment of the show brought to you by your friends at Campus Bookmart. If you had not been to town recently, you need to understand Campus Bookmart. The bully shop has been completely renovated. Go by and check them out. They're doing the grand reopening today. And, and, you know, Labor Day weekend, they're working, right? So go by and check them out. See their smiling faces. So much good merchandise to choose from. The biggest selection of Mississippi State merchandise anywhere. A lot of people make that claim, and it's just rhetoric. It's just not the case. But uh, Campus Bookmart doing a great job for a great fan base for many, many years. A Stark building an institution. There's no doubt about it. If you can't make it to town, let me encourage you to visit them on the World Wide Web at campusbookmart.net. And by being a loyal Boneyard listener, we'll give you a phrase that pays. That is BSR, which stands for Beautiful Steve Robertson. That'll get you free shipping on all orders over 50 bucks. Any order less than $50, absolutely incomplete. Which reminds me, I will be there tomorrow. I will be at Book Bart and Cafe today from 4 to 6 downtown Starkville and 2 to 4 tomorrow at Campus Bookmark. Come by and check me out, and uh, we'll sign some books for you. And we talk a little rock and roll, too, while you're there. All right, let's get into uh, last night's action. We did have a couple of SEC games. 
we're picking the spread this year, so I, it's sometimes it's difficult for me to keep up. But uh, I did pick Tennessee to win and cover, and boy, did they ever. 59 to 10 winners, and uh, it didn't take Tennessee long. I mean, it's like a couple passes, and next thing you know, it's, the ball game is over. It was 38 to nothing at the break, and after three, 52 to seven, and uh, they didn't even let Ball State win the fourth quarter. So 59 to 10 winners, and uh, Hendon Hooker was outstanding, and again took them no time at all. You know, one play, 23 yard touchdown pass to Jalen Hyatt to make it seven to nothing. They had a field goal. Hooker then adds a run for a touchdown, another run. Then Jabari Small gets into the end zone. Walker Merrill, a touchdown pass from Hendon Hooker. And so you kind of see where we're going here. Hendon Hooker making a case for SEC Player of the Week in Week 1. Jalen Wright on the ground from three yards out. Ball State finally gets on the ball. Then Dylan Sampson from two yards out. I mean, it, it, it's clear that uh, they're going to do some pretty cool things. Jimmy Holiday, remember him? He reels in a pass from Joe Milton the third, deep in the fourth quarter. And then uh, Ball State adds a field goal, 59 to 10. So Hendon Hooker, 18 of 25 with a pair of touchdowns and 221 yards in the air. <laughs> and then Hendon Hooker, uh, five rushes for just 12 yards, but two touchdowns. So we accounted for four touchdowns on the night. Uh, pretty impressive night considering the competition and the fact that he didn't play the full game. Um, Joe Milton III was the starter last year this time and uh, was 8 of 9 for 113 yards. Josh Heupel doing a good job up there. And I told you guys, I think Tennessee is kind of that sneaky team in the East that could really have a say in kind of the bowl pecking order on that side of the com- of the conference. And so it'll be interesting to kind of see how things go. And uh, not a 100-yard rusher by anybody, right? Rushes for 88 yards. Uh, but when you begin to look at these numbers, man, it's, uh, you know, Tennessee kind of doing it by committee. Tennessee got a big game next week against Pitt. You remember last year, Kenny Pickett and those guys uh, beat the Volunteers. I'll give you a little teaser for next week. I think the Volunteers are going to go up there and beat Pitt. Pitt uh, ranked 17th in the country this year uh, to open the season. Pretty, some crazy games last night, too. It was so great. I mean, you, you had the guy that uh, – you had the kid that uh, punted after the line of scrimmage from South Carolina State. But Pitt wins the backyard brawl 38-31. I, I don't know. I agree with uh, Pete Burns here. I don't think that Pitt is ready for this Tennessee offense because they, they move it in chunks and they get in the red zone and it just kind of beats you up down low. I think Tennessee wins that game. I think Tennessee moves into the top 25. And you start looking at their schedule. The next week, they have Joe Moorhead and the Akron Zip. So it should be a 3-0 and start for the Volunteers as they head into a home game with Florida. Interesting. Should be a good start. Like this Tennessee team, I do. And I'm eager to know what their sanctions are going to be. I won't be surprised if they don't get a postseason ban. They may get one. I don't think it's anything beyond that, even though they had some staffers involved with that. We're having this kinder, gentler NCAA enforcement staff now. They need to streamline the process, but I, I think lesser penalties is not going to you know, inhibit anybody's ability to go out there and, and skirt the rules. But, um, you know, maybe I'm wrong. All right, Missouri wins at home. We talked about the Missouri defense being just an abomination last year. Pretty good job last night. This game was never really in question. I guess Tech had a 3 nothing lead after a quarter, and then the Missouri offense explodes in the second quarter with 24 points. It's a 24-10 lead, and then Tech gets a stop to open up the third quarter. Can't do anything with it. Next thing you know, man, th- this game is over. It's 38-10 to after three, and then they 14-14 to tie there in the fourth quarter. So Missouri wins 52-24. Lifelong uh, Missouri fan. Brady Cook finally getting his opportunity to kind of do what he needs to do, kind of coming into his own. There were some times last night it was a little bit, you know, fragmented, I guess. He threw a big pick, and um, it was a couple times he missed some open receivers and threw behind him. They, they'll get there, though. Uh, it's just, you know, defensively, what are they going to do? Cook, 18 of 27, 201 yards, a touchdown, and the pick there. And then uh, Jack Abraham got in the ball game. 
two of three for 34 yards. And, hey, good for Jack, right? I mean, this is a guy last year that had those ridiculously complicated concussion issues in fall camp and never truly got to show Mississippi State people what he could do. I still think Will Rogers would have been the dude. But you like to see Jack Abraham back on the football field and having an opportunity to play the game that he loves. Uh, Pete ran for 72 yards, Schrader for 70. Uh, Cook even pitched in 61, kind of a dual threat guy there. Had the long touchdown run, too, of 20 yards. It looked like they had the angle on him, and he's able to kind of get it done. Uh, but they spread it around a good bit. And they've recruited well here as of late. Uh, Love at 76 yards uh, of receiving. Bannister, uh, 43. But uh, an interesting ball game for sure. And now you start thinking, okay, I thought Missouri would win. I thought Tech would make it interesting. They didn't make it interesting enough. And so you start looking ahead for Missouri next weekend. And there are some really good games next weekend. Missouri at Kansas State. And they get a little extra time to prepare. Pretty cool thing if you're Missouri. And so is the defense fixed? I don't know. I don't know. But I know last night that uh, they took care of business. Now, Kansas State will open up tomorrow against South Dakota. That should be a dub. And that will be an 11 a.m. ESPN2 start next Saturday between Kansas State and Missouri. That's an intriguing game. E- eager to see what the line ends up being. Uh, with that but uh, again a lot of games coming up I'll run through the schedule real quick we won't preview the game we did that on Wednesday but reminder your 11 a.m. kick on the SEC network is Sam Houston State at Texas A&M the afternoon full of intrigue Oregon at Georgia it's your 230 game on ABC Cincinnati at Arkansas it's an ESPN 230 game Troy at Ole Miss three o'clock game and then we get into the evening. Now, we'll all be at Davis Wade Stadium kind of getting ready for our game. But uh, Utah and Florida, that's a 6 p.m. kick on ESPN for those of you watching at home. Mine of Ohio will be at Kentucky. Mercer at Auburn. Elon at Vanderbilt looking to go 2-0. Utah State at Alabama. Memphis, of course, at Mississippi State. Georgia State at South Carolina. Florida State on Sunday, 6.30 kick against LSU on, on ABC. Now, those really you know, bad, like, no-line non-conference games, like the Kentucky, Auburn, and Vanderbilt games, will all be on the SEC Network Plus. You'll need to use your app. I can't imagine that you'll want to do that because Mississippi State's playing 30 minutes later. Like, you want to go to all that trouble. But the uh, reality of it is, is we're here. You know, already got people kind of converging on, on town. People already kind of showing up, getting ready to you know, kind of stock their tailgates and things of that nature. And, of course, the balcony's open. Our buddy Roy, part of a balcony group up there. So I'm eager to kind of see how that how that goes. And, and I asked Dave Murray. I didn't take the tour the other day. I, I was finishing up the show before the Mike Leach press conference. And uh, Dave and some of the guys in the media went and took that tour. And I asked Dave specifically about sidelines. I said, you know, I was worried about those fans, even though there are not a lot of them, that may be kind of seated next to the balconies. Is there a sideline issue? He said, absolutely not. He said the way that it's set up, because sometimes we forget how high that is and the angle with which the ball game uh, is viewed. It's just not an issue. And, and I worried about that. That was my biggest concern. I said, I'm about to see it in person. And I think now you look at it and you say, okay, well, maybe this worked out the way they intended. And uh, I, I know a lot of people like it. I'm eager to kind of get fan reaction here. All right, I want to talk a little bit uh, about this Memphis series. We, we didn't go into great detail the other day. But uh, we have played the Tigers 45 times, 45. Mississippi State's won 33. We've lost just 12 times in the history. But there was a stretch there, you know, in the uh, early 60s where we really struggled to get a win against these guys. We opened up the series with them in 1951 and played them pretty regularly for the next decade. And Mississippi State opens up, you know, just kind of getting after these guys. We win the first nine in the series. Our first loss – Came in 1962, a 28-7 loss in Starrick Bowl. And then we lost the next two in both 63 and 65. We take a nine-year hiatus, and we come back in 74. And that's the memorable Rocky Falker game we mentioned earlier, 29-28 to that year. And, and, again, I told you that was a significant win for us. That year, the Memphis Tigers went 7-4. and four. They open up with a win at Louisville, 16-10. They lose the next week to Southern Miss, 6-0. Then they beat Ole Miss, 15-7. to 
Then they beat Colorado State at Colorado State 20 to 18. They beat Cincinnati and Memphis 13 to 7. And so they entered that ball game with Mississippi State with a 4 and 1 record and a three game winning streak. And then Mississippi State wins. And the Tigers didn't go into tank after that. They responded the next week, went to North Texas and beat the Mean Green 41 0. They then beat Florida State 42 to 14. Then they lose at Tennessee, 34-6, and then lose at number 14, Houston, 13-10, and then bounce back and win the final game of the year, 34-10, over Wichita State. So it was a good year uh, for Memphis. And, you know, that little stretch there, the Tigers are pretty good. You know, I guess when Pancos got there in 72, things kind of began to turn around. In 73, the Tigers are 8-3. and three. You know, pretty good year. For them, eight and three for sure. And again, they beat Ole Miss that year, and they beat Louisville again that year. They beat North Texas. Now they lost to Houston, but um, you know, an eight and three year in those days was pretty impressive, especially for an independent team like Memphis. And so again, it wasn't just some cakewalk game. We had a lot of players too that we recruited that went to Memphis. It wasn't like it is nowadays where you have this hierarchy in Southern college football. Well, after that win, Mississippi State goes on in uh, 75. We beat Memphis again, and then we beat them again in 76. So a three-game winning streak for the Bulldogs. In 77, the Tigers get even. They get us 21-13. In 78, we blow them out 44-14. And then that's at Memphis. In 79, we play them in Jackson for some reason. It made sense to play Alabama and LSU and people like that. But, uh, again, maybe that just kind of showed – you know, the notoriety of the game at the time. But we lose that game 14-13. We go back to Memphis the next year in 1980. That's the beginning of the John Bond era. And uh, John uh, puts together a pretty good run against these guys. 1980 State wins 34-7. to We win the next year 20-3 to and then 41-17. to So, uh, we went for three years there, kind of dominated things. In 83, they get us 30-13. to In 84, 23-12. And then in 85... 31-28 winners. An exciting game. We, we blow them out the next year, 34-17. We squeak by them in 87, 9-6. And then in 88, they get us 31-10. We put together back-to-back wins the next two years, beat them 35-10, and then in 1990, 27-23. They get us in 91, 28-23. And that's the thing you look at, Big you know, Tia, Jackie's first year, you would think those are games we should win, and we should have. 92, we get them. And then in 93 – which was the last win in this series for Memphis in a while. They get us 45-35. We just simply couldn't stop them. Simply just couldn't stop them. And then we string together a very, very impressive streak from 94 to 2011. We didn't lose a game until last year. And, but most of these games were competitive. And that's the thing that I kind of look at, too. It's like there's just some – there's a culture thing at Memphis. You know, they had a couple lean years there uh, before they made some coaching changes up there. But um, – and the reality of it is, is that Memphis has played us pretty tough, even in games that we've won here in recent memory. In 94, State won 17-6. We win by 10 in 95, 28-18. Then 31-10 winners. And then in 97, you remember that year, 13-10, to that's the Brian Hazelwood game where Hazelwood had to make that last-second field goal to win the game. One of the last times I bet on Mississippi State, I thought we would cover easily, and we didn't. We didn't cover. In, 90, in 98, the year we win the West – that great team there. Or maybe that was 99. Yeah. yeah. We won the West in 98, 14-6. In 99, it's when Hazelwood hit the field goal. So, excuse me. I got my 13-10 to 10 wins over Memphis mixed up. Uh, in 2000, we went 17-3. to 3. You remember the crazy 2001 year? We opened with Memphis, and it took us a while to get going. But once we did, we blew them out 30-10. to 10. But it was a fight for a while. I think a block punts what got us going. If I remember correctly, it was Nathan Jackson with the block there. In 03, a lean year for us, but we, we managed to scratch out a win against them, 35-27. And then Dan Mullen was absolutely unmerciful against Memphis, 49-7 and 59-14. I remember Big Boward having a huge game against Memphis. And then we lose that game last year. All that's been well documented about last year. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about that. But um, to ignore how that all worked out last year would be to be short-sighted. Now, what's interesting, too, we talked about that officiating crew. And it's interesting. Some of the names have been scrubbed from the box scores. I don't understand why or any, why anybody would do that. 
I, I say that because if a player drops a touchdown pass, he has to go face the media at some point, right? So, that I mean, those quotes that play, the video evidence of that moment is going to be around forever. And chances are, if you look like the Bo Wallace fumble in the Egg Bowl a few years back, I mean, it, it makes the rounds again on social media. So if players have to be accountable and coaches have to be accountable, why don't officials have to be accountable? Well, there has been some measure of accountability against these officials. And I don't remember the back judge's name, the guy that blew the play dead. And then what I was told from sources close to the topic, when asked about it, he didn't own up to it. And that led to some disciplinary action. Of course, I'm getting that second hand. Um, but you can see that he threw his beanbag down and went in to signal a play. And then uh, Calvin picks it up and runs it back 94 yards for a touchdown. And, you know, we, again, we can go through all the merits of Martin Emerson being in contact with the ground with his knee and then touching the football. You know, how long do you consider that possession? You know, you could make it easy by just picking it up, throwing it to the official. You could. But how many times do you see a punt rolling, 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 and then everybody just stands over to let the clock run and the official step in and blow it dead. Um, so that is a debatable situation. But what is not debatable is that those officials should be held accountable. Now, I did the research last year during the season, and I don't recall that back judge officiating an SEC game the rest of the year. Now, that information wasn't made public except when I did it. You know, the league didn't come out and make a statement about it, and perhaps they should. Again, I don't know why the officials were treated with such kid gloves. Well, Mark Curls was the, uh, the white hat in that ball game. Now, Mark Curls, of course, been around for a while. Arkansas fans absolutely despise him, and it always seems that controversy follows him. Maybe it's not controversy. Maybe it's just ineptitude. Last night, Mark Curls was the center judge in the Tennessee game, not a white hat. So that tells me that, that there has been a change of sorts. Now, it's not to say that Curls will never be a white hat again, but he was also that officiating crew when he had the debacle with Tennessee and Ole Miss last year. And, again, not to play at the end because he was clearly short of the line to gain. But Matt Corral fumbles and Tennessee picks it up and runs it back for a touchdown. And then Curls' crew ruled that it was not a fumble. And then ultimately there was some – discussion later that it should have been and so mark curl's crew last year very 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 maligned in many respects so it looks like this year that curls does not have a crew he is on a crew rather than leading a crew and that's good for the southeastern conference and so i shared that with you guys because i think it's important to tell both sides of the story because we all get out here and we just lambast these officials when they do something stupid and what happened last year at Memphis was absolutely stupid. It is one of the wildest things I have ever seen in all the years of covering and watching college football. That the ball was touched down, signaled down by the official, and the next thing you know, a guy picks it up and runs it back for a touchdown. And when that happened, I, I, turned, I don't remember who was sitting next to me on press row. I said, oh, review will fix that. They'll, they'll fix that. And they didn't. They didn't. And when we're sitting there in disbelief, because number one, it's midway through the fourth quarter. Now all of a sudden it's a what, 28-17 game. So we go from a situation where our offense had kind of stalled out a little bit, but special teams who really had a difficult year last year really did a good job here. Special teams gets a punt inside the 10 down to the six. And the next thing you know, it's a touchdown for Memphis. You know, there had to be some level of accountability. I think it's important that you guys understand that, that uh, you know, based on what I've seen and what I've heard, there has been some accountability. Why it wasn't made public, I can't really you know, share with you. Uh, I remember when Penn Wagers and his crew in that game against Arkansas that uh, Mike Slive publicly came out and said that these guys were going to be suspended. You know, it's, it's kind of like raising kids, right? I mean, it's like sometimes you, you spank the rest of them. You spank one to refer to the rest of them. The rest of them kind of get in line. But there is some accountability to fans, too. you got to let fans know what's going on. And, like, I get the fact they issue these statements, but that doesn't change anything. And so there has to be a measure of accountability, and it appears in this situation there has been. I think it's important to understand. It's important to note and document that that the officials that were involved in that debacle at, at Memphis, who were SEC officials, were held accountable. And maybe not all of them, 
but certainly the guy that that blew the play dead and then didn't own up to it, and then the white hat, those guys should have been held accountable. And based on the information that I have today, they have been. Now, everybody's like, well, Steve, what crew are we getting tomorrow? Well, it'll be an AAC crew. You know, it'll be the Memphis officials that'll come to Davis Wade Stadium. You know, when we go on the road, we get our own officials. That's typically how that works unless you're in a bowl game. And then you get, you know, a neutral league's officials. So it'll be a AAC group. I don't know what their point of emphasis is this year, but it will not, you know, unless there's been some late change or something that I'm unaware of, it will not be an SEC crew officiating the game at Davis Wade Stadium. And that's a good thing based on some of the history that we've had in recent years. And that's really the rub for me, and I've said it over and over again. It's like we, we, we have the greatest cathedrals in all of college football, with rare exception, right? I mean, we really do. We have incredible fan atmosphere. I mean, you look at those Pac-12 games. I mean, it's like, well, there's more to do out there. I don't care about that. You know, that I'm, I'm sure I could find plenty of other things to do with my Saturday night if I wasn't covering a Mississippi State game. I mean, I'm going to stay home. But I love Mississippi State, so I'm going to be there. You see these Pac-12 games, there's nobody there. And so we've got these amazing fan bases. We have incredible fan support. And we're asking people to pay more and more and more for tickets and more and more for concessions and sit in longer lines. We're we're asking a greater commitment from the fans. And and then you have these officials that um, don't go out there and officiate the game properly. And listen, there are a lot of guys out there doing a great job. I'm in no way trying to just paint the big brush on everybody. And we got to meet some of those guys uh, that came during practice this year. They'd come out there and they'd officiate the scrimmages and things like that. We got to meet some of those guys and talk to some of those guys. And I can tell you they're good guys. They want to get it right. Yeah, I had, I had an official tell me one time that his goal every game is that both teams feel like they got a fair shake and that none of the fans know his name. That's, it seems like a modest goal. But think about this. We should never as fans know the names of officials. Ever. Why should we ever know their names? Now, we should, now, they should be made available to us. But why should we remember an official's name? Well, you're not going to remember the guy making a great call, right? I mean, we talk about Scott Klein, right, for baseball, how bad his strike zone is. You know what? I'll give Scott Klein some credit. In the SEC tournament game a couple years ago between Tennessee and Alabama, on the last play of the game, what would have been the last play of the game, Scott Klein called interference – Tennessee and those guys had run on the field. They were celebrating. Everybody had to go back. That's integrity. I think the guy's strike zone is terrible. And I think the last couple of years, his performance has not been good. But in that situation, that's a very difficult call for an official to make. And ultimately, that call made the game continue, and Alabama came back to win. And so I'm sure Tennessee folks weren't happy about it, but it was the right call. So you've got a bad official there. It's made a good call. I think you give credit where credit's due. But the reason like – you you don't have a favorite official, but you've got a bunch of names. You're like, I know that guy. That guy screwed us. I mean, the fact that Dick Pace's name is still thrown around all these years later for that stupid call he made in the egg ball that gave Ole Miss the win. It's a name that will live in infamy in the Mississippi State fan base forever. It'll be passed down from generations. Dick Pace. Well, who's Dick Pace? And, and the call, you can find it on YouTube. If, you, if you're unfamiliar with it, you can find Dick Pace's call. Mississippi State picks off a ball in the end zone, in the egg ball to end the game. And he called pass interference, and the defensive back never had contact with the receiver. The ball was underthrown. They give Ole Miss basically, you know, first down at, at, at the goal line, and they score, and they win the egg ball. But Dick Pace cost us that game. And it's like you think about Jeff Batts back in, uh, what was it, 18? We go over there, 19, we go over to Alabama. We have a Kylan Hill touchdown nullified because of a block in the back on Dedrick Thomas. It didn't happen. I just happened to be on that sideline. I got to pick the picture myself. Dedrick Thomas never hit him. You had a guy that was out of the play diving to make a tackle, playing his best effort, and just came up a little bit short there. And Kylan Hill gets in. It was Shaheem Carter. A kid from Amy or, or uh, Kentwood, Louisiana, kid that I covered in high school. You know, it's like so. You look at this, and then Jeff Batts throws that flag, and then Jeff Batts didn't officiate an SEC game the rest of the year, and I don't know that he, that he is again. And so, and I had somebody hit me up yesterday about the Calvin Ridley thing back in seventeen. 
you know, how he runs out of bounds himself, and, and you've got the son of a former Alabama quarterback making that play. And so we remember these things and we bring them up because they matter to us. But I think it's also fair, fair to the SEC to say, hey, you know, listen, they didn't make this public. I think they should have. But at least we don't have, you know, Mark Curls out there leading the crew again after having two major malfunctions last year that changed the outcome of football games. Right? I think it's fair. All right, final segment of the show brought to you by your friends at Portico. I've told you guys before, if, if I'm moving to Portico, if I'm moving to Starkville, I'm moving to Portico. I live out in the sticks right now. Maybe you do too. I would like to be closer to campus. I spend so much time down there now. And I moved out here. You know, I had this house full of kids. I don't have that anymore. I'm, I'm going to be an empty nester next year. And so I, I would think, hey, I got all this acreage out here. It'd be nice not to have to worry about cutting the grass. And so I think about all that stuff. So maybe learn from me. I guess maybe buy my house so I can move to Portico. Or you could just move to Portico. You know, maybe you want a bunch of land and a bunch of grass to cut. I, I, I don't. So let me encourage you. Think about moving to Portico. And maybe you, you've always wanted a place in Starkville. You've always said, I mean, it would be so great to have our own place in Starkville and uh, never have to worry about packing up all this tailgate stuff and bringing it all over the country. It's a lot, man. I know it's a real commitment to do that. But if you had it all right here, it'd be a whole lot easier to do that. Phase one completely sold out. Phase two under construction. Some of those homes are sold too, but there are some lots available where if you need a custom build, you can get that. Reach out to our friend Brooks Bryan. I love Brooks. You'll love Brooks, too. If you've never dealt with Brooks, you'll enjoy the experience. It's a really down-to-earth guy from the great city of Philadelphia, Mississippi, former Diamond Dog. 601-416-8075. Again, 601-416-8075. Portico, a great place to live, for sure. Make Portico your next move. All right, let's spend some time talking about this transfer stuff before we get out the door. You know, we've talked NIL today. We've talked transfer. It'll be nice when those things are no longer like regular items of conversation. But there was some meaningful legislation passed about transfers early this week. The, um, and there have been all these recommendations. The first thing that, that didn't pass is they did, they're not allowing unlimited transfers. You know, we had the one-time transfer exception, and then, then there was this measure like, well, what if we just let everybody transfer all the time? which I think would just create absolute lunacy and probably impermissible benefits just out the yin-yang. I think it would be absolutely ridiculous. It, and you talk about having open free agency in college football. That's what it would be. There, there'd be no real commitment to an institution. The guys would just be going to the highest bidder year after year after year. You, you talk about a Pandora's box. It's already a, it's, it's a train wreck as it is. And all of a sudden, if, if you have to deal with this year after year, Ridiculous. I mean, like right now, like Mississippi State, it's like you got these, these transfers that come in, you know, they, they've been in the portal and they've got a couple of years of eligibility left. Well, unless they go pro, they're going to be with you. Unless they graduate, they're going to be with you. They, they still could be with you if they're it's a grad, if they don't grad transfer. But they have shelved that proposal, and my hope is that goes away forever. There's this, that, you talk about chaos in college football, college athletics. So the one thing that I have really advocated for on this show – and on other shows when I've been on there, is that we needed to have transfer windows. We have done that. I think it is pretty much perfect. At the end of each semester, you have an opportunity to enter the transfer portal. You don't have to make your decision then. You can do it, you know, like whether you transfer in the spring and you go in for summer session or not. But at the end of each semester, you can enter the portal. There is a 60-day window that is split into two segments. If you're a fall athlete, you get 45 days after December and 15 days after the spring. Much different if you're a spring sport athlete, you'll get 15 in December and then 45 in the spring. So after your season is over, you got about six weeks there for you can decide if you want to go into the portal. That's how it should be. We shouldn't have 365 24 hour a day transfer alerts. It just shouldn't be that way. I mean, what happens, you know, a player, you know, let's say, you know, I think about some of the coaches that I've had over the years. I had a coach named Wayne Scarborough. He was a great man, but he, he would get next to you sometimes. And sometimes he'd hurt my feelings, and I was a team captain. He'd come out there and get on you. He'd coach you hard. 
And so it's like now all of a sudden you can't coach these kids hard because they go get in the portal. Well, at least now you've got a chance to coach them hard and then build them back up because a lot of people make emotional decisions. I'm just going to get in the portal. Well, okay, go get in the portal. You just got to wait now to the end of the semester to do it. That is the right move. Because right now your coaches of all sports are having to recruit every day. And I don't just mean prospective players. I mean their current players. You got to recruit them every day. You can't coach them. You got to recruit them and you got to coddle them. And I think that's wrong. I think not only does it send a bad message, but also, too, I think as a result, the development of certain players is, is somewhat limited. I mean, I, I, the, you can't coach every kid the same way. You, you can't. You know, there, there are some, some people you can drive. There are other people you got to lead. You know, I think about my own kid, you know, who played college baseball. When I got on him, he shut down on me. Now, I could hold him accountable after a ball game, but if I really pushed him in practice or something like that, he would shut down on me. So what I had to do is when he did what I wanted him to do, I'd have to praise him. I said, that's what I want it done right there. Good job. That's what I want. I had some other kids. I had a kid named Tyler Burrell on my team. It's like, you know, the way he responded is basically if you basically told him that you knew he couldn't. I, I knew it was a mistake to put you out here because you couldn't handle it. Well, then all of a sudden he's bound and determined to show me. But if I start praising him, he relaxes. You can't coach every kid the same way. And it's like we want this cookie-cutter college athletics now where it's, oh, well, everything's just so happy, joy, and free. That's just not the case. And so I think you've got to be able to coach some kids hard. And, like, some people would say, well, you know, this is, you know, they're, they're being harassed or they're being verbally abused. You know, there's some things that I could say about that that, you know, I mean, when, when the Russians show up, we'll have some of our citizens join them. You know, we have got to socialize and toughen up our kids. We do. And, again, I'm not going to get into some political foray about every bit of that. But it's like you're basically making coaches coach with one arm tied behind their back. And now, at the very least, you got a chance, that if you do have to go get in somebody's hindquarters today, at least tomorrow, we can go sit down and have a meeting about it and say, okay, listen, here's, how, here's, here's, how, here's what went wrong yesterday. Here's how we fix it. I think that's important. All right, so here is a quote, too, um, from Georgia President uh, Jerry Moorhead. Like the peers in the general student population, college athletes choose to transfer for any number of reasons. And that's true. Sometimes we think it's all related to uh, competition or, or playing time. It's not. We believe in the changes enacted today enable member schools to adapt to students' needs while also positioning students for long-term academic success. These changes to NCAA rules recognize further study is needed on graduation rates before we consider authorizing multiple transfer opportunities with immediate eligibility. We will continue to review potential modification to transfer rules as the landscape evolves over time. The graduation piece is sometimes lost in all this. Like when we, the, one of the best things we ever did is we put in the grad transfer thing, right? Because it was basically about academics. It's like, hey, if I'm at NC State and they don't have what I want to pursue is an advanced degree or a master's, well, then I can transfer because I have earned my degree. I'm going to help my school's APR. I have achieved my college dream of getting an education. And so now we're going to let you, hey, you can go somewhere else. And so every bit of that was kind of academically motivated. And when you look at what Moorhead said here about graduation rates, about transfers, if you've got guys bouncing around and ladies, if you have student athletes moving around year to year to year, what are the chances of them graduating? Well, you know, for some students, they're going to graduate because they're going to take care of business. But there are other ones that need some help. They need the opportunity uh, to be able to um, to have tutoring, you know, to have advisors that help them through the academic, uh, you know, issues. That's important. And sometimes we forget that. It's like, oh, it's all about sports, and it shouldn't be. And so I'm, I was glad to read that. I think it's important to consider because if somebody goes to four schools in four years, what do you think the chances of them graduating are? And what if all those credits don't transfer? What if, you know, the curriculum is a little bit different? What if the degree requirements are different? And all of a sudden, well, who's going to pay for it? They have to go for a fifth year of school, right? A lot to think about. 
Athletes will also be guaranteed financial aid at their next schools through completion of their eligibility or completion of an undergraduate degree. Extra consideration if a player either loses their head coach or has their scholarship adjusted. What that means if it's a partial scholarship sport, they reduce their scholarship. So there are some issues out there, too, with all this financial aid stuff that um, <clears throat> still being worked out. You know, because a university, once a player goes into the portal, they've not been obligated to pay any other financial aid. Well, now that we're doing this basically at the end of the season, end of the semester, that's going to eliminate that issue. So you won't have, like you've heard about this Deion Smith thing, you won't have that issue kind of going forward. I think that's important to understand, too. You know, a student athlete, especially people that's got advisors in their ear, is they're thinking about, you know, the big, the big prize, right? I, I need to get out of here and get somewhere I can get on the field. And then the people around them, I think, are sometimes somewhat ignorant about the process. And they didn't understand, oh, well, when this guy, you know, they don't, they're no longer on scholarship at some schools. Now, at Mississippi State, I believe, with, without any exception, I believe we've allowed people to remain on financial aid. They just didn't have, like, maybe access to our facilities. But we let them finish up their education, let them finish up their semester. And you've got to think, I mean, how, how, many, how much expenses could there be, you know, that late in the semester? But there are some times. And so the reality of it is, is that some young people out there had some pretty hefty bills. So this eliminates that. And that, that's a good thing. I, I just don't think that's in the spirit of, 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 good, of good form, shall we say. Um, and they, we talked about these waivers, too. The, uh, I, I've always been a proponent, too, like, if the transferring school, like, say, for an example, if a player leaves us, let's say a men's basketball player leaves us and goes to UAB, and we have no objection. Maybe we don't play UAB next year. We're like, you know what, hey, this is a great kid. And he just didn't didn't get to play much here. So why should he have to sit the next place? We discussed that. And so I think everybody, as long as the two schools agree, I don't think the NCAA should have any say so whatsoever. Because we're the ones losing the student athlete, right? Well, UAB is gaining a student athlete, so of course UAB would love for him to be available. But you know, what do we gain by restricting his eligibility for a year? Well, nothing if we're not going to play him. So if both schools agree, we should just get it done. Now, and it appears we're taking some steps toward that. We're going to have you know, more flexibility for that. We, I don't know all the details behind that, but again, I say if both schools agree. Now, also from the CBS article, it's interesting. Some numbers here. NCAA revealed in the spring that 950 undergraduate football players entered a transfer portal in 2021. That's up 587 the year before. A total of 54% of those players enrolled at another institution. That's not good. 5% of them removed their, portal, their names from the portal and returned to their school. It's a pretty small number. 41% were still in the portal at the time the report was released in April. Now, some of those likely found college homes, but the reality of it is, is you know, you got 950 kids going in there, and then you've got, you know, what is it, 375 or so that, that don't go on. So there's some risk-reward with the portal. And I would love to see, we talk about graduation, I'd love to see how many of those kids graduate. Right? They're student-athletes. Now, I'm a firm believer, too, is uh, you choose the behavior, you choose the consequence. And so that's a big part of it, too, for these kids. You're making an adult decision, and you're about to learn a very difficult lesson about life. So be sure you know what you're doing. That's one of the reasons you see all these people that kind of already have, you know, kind of what's going on. Um, so we'll see. And listen, if you hadn't done so, go to dogpilethebook.com and uh, you can order some books and get them signed. You get all my sports books there. You get Blooms Voliander at Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, BooksMillion.com. You can get them at great bookstores everywhere. If you're looking for Stark Villains gear, you can find it at StarkVillains.com. Again, I'm going to be later today. I will be at Book Mart and Cafe downtown, 4 to 6, and then tomorrow, 2 to 4 at Campus Book Mart. So if you're in town for the game, come by. You can see me. We can talk some rock and roll. Chances are I'll be wearing a Lillian Axe shirt, kind of promoting the show. I'm excited about the show. I hope you guys are excited about the show. You should be. It's going to be a great time. And, again, go to Eventbrite to get those tickets, and the link is everywhere on my social media. It's pretty easy to find. If you can't find it, just hit me up. Let me know. I'm happy to send it to you. We're raising money for Mississippi State's NIL efforts. Trying to be a little innovative with this, right? We're trying to do something a little bit different. 
you know, and at the same time raise a lot of money. I, I've said this many times on the show. A lot of people say, Steve, I want to be involved, but I don't know what to do. I have I've offered a suggestion to you again. If you are part of a Mississippi State alumni group somewhere out of state, put together a 5K. It's very easy to do. Not a lot of money involved in all that, and then you can get that together, and your chapter can write a check to the Bulldog Initiative, and you will have done part of your part. Because not only that, not only will you have Mississippi State money, you'll have local money, right? And we're even advertising the Rock Vegas show over on the Texas A&M. Like, hey guys, if you guys come to the ball game, we got a good rock show to get it for you on Friday. Oh, well, all the money goes to your collective. It sure does. It does. So maybe we'll get some Texas A&M people to spend some money at our show that'll help fund our athletes, right? So think outside the box a little bit. Think about what you can do because it's here now. It's not somebody else's problem. It's our collective problem. And people are like, oh, well, I don't understand why we can't ever consistently recruit in the top 25 in football. Why, you know, why aren't we back in Omaha? Well, this is going to be part of it. This is part of it. The way to ensure success is to ensure that Mississippi State is competitive on the NIL front. It's an important part of it, you know, and, and the way I, and I had a discussion with one of the guys, one of the principals of the collective, and I love what he said. He said the way to get people to come to Mississippi State for NIL is not to give them money as recruits, but to show them that we get people here getting big deals. If you come to Mississippi State, it is a big deal, and you get an opportunity uh, to get some cool NIL opportunities. And so I think that's an important way to do it. You, you read all this stuff online and, and you, you think, you know, the, a lot of people don't have a plan. We clearly have a plan and you can be a part of it. And, and I would love to hear that, hey, Steve, we decided at the Birmingham uh, MSU Alumni Association, we're going to do a trail race or we're going to do a 5K around here and, and uh, we're going to raise money for our chapter and we're going to help NIL. I think it'd be wonderful to do that in Birmingham or Baton Rouge or New Orleans or, you know, Montgomery or Atlanta, whatever. I mean, I'm not special. You guys can do this too. You know, maybe you don't know a lot of people in rock music, but you can put a 5K together. You can put a Carl West together, a bake sale, anything. Anything to help raise some money uh, for the betterment of our Mississippi State Athletics programs. All right, I'll see you guys soon. Uh, it's going to be great. We'll be talking about a Bulldog win on Monday, hopefully, you know, you know, barring something totally unforeseen. But I'm eager to see you guys all back in Stark at Davis Wade Stadium. i got to get dressed, get cleaned up a little bit, and, and head to town. Dave Murray and I are going to shoot a video and uh, kind of preview in the game, and then we'll be um, we'll be off and running. We'll be at book signings, and then we'll be uh, be at a ball game tomorrow evening. I hope that you guys can make it. But until next time, let's all live our lives in a way we make more friends than enemies, and people can see a difference in the way we live. Progressive Snapshot can save you money based on how you drive and how much you drive. So the safer you drive, the more money you could save. Now, if you didn't hear that because you were looking at your phone while driving, let me say it again. Seriously, put down your phone. That is so unsafe. If you didn't do stuff like use your phone while driving, you could save money with Progressive Snapshot. But saving or not, just put it down. <clears throat> and if you did hear it the first time because you weren't looking at your phone, nice work. You'd love Snapshot from Progressive because it rewards safe drivers. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Snapshot not available in California and North Carolina or from all agents. It's Macy's Labor Day sale, so gear up as summer cools down with 30% off timeless looks from Levi's and specials like 30 to 50% off statement making shoes for her and 60% off luggage from Samsonite and more. Or use your coupon or Macy's card and get an extra 20% off more great deals. Plus, Star Rewards members can earn rewards even faster during Macy's Star Money bonus days. Going on now. Savings off regular sale and clearance prices. Exclusions apply.